Hey guys, welcome to season three of the Hornady podcast. We wanted to thank you guys for all of the support, for the likes, the comments, the shares, the subscriptions. We really appreciate it. We thought we'd start season three with a little bit of Q&A. So I've got senior ballistician Jaden Quinlan and project engineer Miles Neville to go through some Q&A from our last 50 or 60 episodes. We hope you enjoy it. I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and I'm joined today with the favorite guys on the show, Miles Neville, Jaden Quinlan. Guys, thanks for coming on the show. You bet. Man, we, we made it. You I know. made it. The big time. You made it to the big time, uh, which is like a micro small time, but your big time it, in that small time. Yeah, it's not real at yeah, all. You start crossing mojinations. I don't know. More I, importantly, though. My head might get a little. I'm going to blow your guys' mind here. You probably haven't realized this yet. I'm sure it'll come to you, but I'm going to help you there. It's 2024 mm -hmm. right now. How weird is that? Yeah, it, does, it won't set in until probably 2025. November. Yeah. It just feels really bizarre to me that I wrote a check this morning. One, that I'm still writing checks for stuff, which is weird. And two, that I dated it 2024. It just seems weird. And so, you know, we've been doing this podcast now for... Gosh, a long time, you know, north of a hundred episodes. And it's just, it's great to one, to have the demand for the podcast from the listener. Because if we weren't getting the views and the listens and the shares, you know, this is our time and our money to do this. We wouldn't continue to do it. Yeah. And so it's great to see that it's been well received and that the people are interacting with us. They're sending in the questions to podcast at hornady.com. They're doing a lot of commenting on YouTube and looking from all of our analytics. The podcasts that have you guys on specifically, but uh, more specifically, the podcasts that are technical in nature really do well analytically as far as the listen through rate and you know just the sheer number of views and downloads. So I've went through, Preston went through rather, I didn't do anything, and, and pulled some YouTube comments out from our more technical episodes. And we've done one Q&A before, so listeners out there, if you haven't, go back and listen to some that first Q&A. Um, you know, that one was really centered on your groups are too small um, and some of those external and internal ballistics podcasts. So over the last 50, 60 episodes, we've went through, pulled out some questions, and I'm going to ask you guys, and you guys are unprepared. I have the questions. You're not allowed to see them. I feel uh, like we're on like the trial, like we're on the stand right yeah. now. We'll see how this goes. Yeah, this is like a cross-examination. <clears throat> I'm going to play hardball. Yep. Bad cop, bad cop kind yep, of thing. for sure. Yeah, Miles is a great it's bad on. cop. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, with that, let's get started in on some of these questions. Now, I've went through and, you know, we, don't, we can't answer all of them on the podcast. There's just way too long. And I've went through and we've got some, you know, underhand softball pitch type of questions that you'll hit out of the park and some more in-depth ones and then some more that are just kind of nuanced where there's not one answer. There's not a right answer. There's just answers, and you got to pick what's right for you. So, without further ado, Ronald Rorick, 4872, on the YouTubes, commented on our 7PRC podcast. He says, always remember that it's remaining energy at whatever distance you are shooting. That's what really counts when shooting big game animals. How much should it be? 1,500 pounds for elk? Question mark. Um, Jaden, I'd really love to hear your uh, answer to this as uh, if they haven't, listeners should check out the Terminal Performance Podcast where you talk in depth about this. Mm -hmm. um, but he says, remember, it's the remaining energy at whatever distance you are shooting that really counts. How would you answer that one? Yeah, I, I would disagree with that statement as it stands, you know, as you read it. Um, not that energy isn't important, it is, but what's important is how the energy gets deposited into the animal because you can have... I think I laid out in that podcast you referenced on terminal ballistics, you can have all the energy in the world, but if it doesn't really deposit very much of it, if it deposits 1% of it into the animal and then the bullet exits the backside of the animal with 99% of the velocity it had when it contacted the animal, you have all the energy in the world, but you didn't deposit it into the animal. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really important um, to, to 
keep those two things in context. Yeah. It's not mutually, you know, exclusive. It's not just about energy. It's how the energy is used. Right. And I think, yeah, bullet construction and bullet design plays a lot into that. You know, mm-hmm. velocity is what makes bullet work, makes bullets work. Right. And when we say bullets work, we mean expand and transfer that energy. So impact velocity equally as important as the energy on target. Yeah. Cause those two things are tied together, right? right. The energy is a function of the velocity. So in general, the threshold kind of hierarchy that we look at is bullets are designed to do a certain job, right? They're designed to expand in a certain way and within a certain velocity window, meaning that if you go above the velocity they're designed to work with that, they're not going to work as designed. And if you go below that, they're not going to work as designed. And generally, when you go too low, which is the side we're mainly concerned with um, uh, from a shooting standpoint, limitation standpoint, right? High velocity just means the animal's close, but you're, you're a lot of times focused on the low velocity stuff because that's how far away can I engage the animal and still have the bullet work reliably. That's all derived based on the velocity. Right on. Excellent. And uh, Yeah. Just to add to that, like uh, the bullet construction matters. Like, Oh yeah. Um, if you, if you know, you can get some terminal performance with some classes of bullets that you, ha- you know whatever but then it can have that bullet could have end up having more terminal energy but then you have another bullet or another cartridge caliber or whatever that ends up with lower energy on target but if you transfer yeah if you transfer more yeah, energy yeah if i if i put 80% of this bullet's energy into and then only 40% of this bullet's well then yeah, yeah. i think a really good example that would would highlight that is an identical bullet shape or a very, very similar bullet shape, let's say seven millimeter, 175 ELDX right. and a 160 CX. If you put them paired up with the exact same impact velocity, the lead core bullet is simply going to be more dramatic, more fat or faster energy transfer because of its faster expansion. Right. Bigger surface area. Yep. So that's yep. a nuanced answer. Um, but yes, energy is important. But velocity and knowing how your bullet was intended right. to work, because yeah, and, and to boil it down even further, the whole, the whole end game is to like inflict tissue damage, and so yeah, if you're not doing that with whatever impact velocity or bullet construction that you have, then then it's a moot point. The energy alone is not the energy is necessary. You have to have energy to transfer it, but yeah, beyond that, awesome. It's it's a little more nuanced. And uh, just his last part of the question: How much should it be for an elk, say fifteen hundred foot pounds? I think. The iconic classic is 900 foot pounds on a deer and 1500 on an elk is what all of the old timers would have said in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even into the 90s. Sure. Yeah. If you want to tie a number to it, yeah. but that doesn't mean it doesn't you mean will anything. or won't right. get a certain result. Exactly. All right. So we handled that one. Moving on here. This comes from Work Sun Junk uh, on the YouTube. He questioned uh, another question on our first Q&A episode. Episode 60 was our first Q&A. He says, you guys will not see consistent ignition when it comes to pressure until you seat the bullet into the lands. Jumping bullets changes pressure. Any bullet engraving into the forcing cone is going to experience changes in pressure. I mean, there's variability shot to shot to shot in that. I, yeah. Whether it's buried, off, uh, yeah. touching. Yeah, so it's not like... So we have pressure and velocity measurement equipment that we use daily, both in R&D and production testing. You, let's say I go find the lands in a given barrel and I shoot a 10 shot group there. And then I take that bullet and I seat it 50 or a hundred thou deeper into the case and shoot 10 of those. The difference in the velocity and pressure variability isn't substantially noticeable. Even on statistically valid sample sizes, it's, you, you maybe would see a trend or something, but it's not. I would disagree with that comment. Yeah. There's, there's a transition. Your primer goes off and you start defligating powder and you're doing a chemical potential energy transfer into kinetic energy, you know, and that has variability period that comes with it. Yeah. <clears throat> and so you're going to see a couple thousand pounds at, As at minimum. I going to say from the testing that I've done when I worked in engineering was if it was touching the lands, buried in the lands or off the lands, if you get a 10 shot string that's got 2,500 to 5,000 foot pounds, or excuse me, PSI of pressure on an extreme spread, that's a good test. And it didn't matter yeah. how the bullet was situated against the rifle. Right. You can control powder charge and whatever. Yeah, we, we, yeah we've, we've tested that. Awesome. 
So moving on to this one, this comes from uh, Daryl Carter, 9401. He says, in regard to the 22 arc, should have been based off the 6.8, 6.8 SPCs meaning, so it could be loaded to the proper pressure and done away with the ridiculous bolt issues. How would you answer that question that the arc should have been on the 6.8? That's a 224 Valkyrie. Yeah. What are some of the nuances that maybe not everyone would understand uh, that would have come along if had we done the 6.8 case instead of a Grendel case? You have decreased volume with the SPC parent case. Um, and so you have higher pressure, but decreased volume. The, the net result is very close, but it kind of gives a slight edge to the Grindel case. Okay. So the, the increase in volume yeah. outweighs the reduced pressure for yep. the bolt thrust issue. What about length? Uh, yeah, the, you would, to get the case length the same as a 22 arc from an SPC case would limit that volume even further. Yeah. And if you left it a full SPC case. It's a Valkyrie. Now you're pushing well, the bullet. It's yeah. not exactly, but yeah, you, yeah. And the, the, the issue that the Valkyrie has that we believe is you basically with the longer ogive, the heavy bullets that most people have issues with, if they're going to have issues with that cartridge, uh, you stuff the ogive start basically to the case mouth. Mm hmm and so you have more propensity to have in bore tilt. Mm -hmm. And you have less volume inside the already right. slightly lower volume right. of the case. And, and you're pushing bullet down yeah. into the case. Yep. So there was no advantage. There was only net neutral or negative things to come from using the 6.8 case over a Grindel. Yeah. The, the only advantage we could have had with going to the 6.8 is we probably would have changed some of the chamber dimensions to be more favorable for precision compared to the already existing 224 valkyrie but there wasn't much meat on that bone anyway even even if you improved some of the chamber tolerances that exist in the 224 valkyrie right now you're still hamstrung by yeah. everything Miles you still just have described. to shorten the case to make it optimal for those bullets that we mm -hmm. all want to shoot and by shortening the case you're doing nobody right. any favors and a 3000 psi gain in chamber pressure mm -hmm. it isn't a ton of velocity yeah. awesome yeah. All right. and, and i would also comment that the the bolt related issues that that he notes in there have kind of seemed to have a a bit of a like a legacy dogma too i mean can you get a like are all bolts equal in the grendel bolt face family 100 percent, no i mean we've tested you know a bunch of different types of bolts <clears throat> and some of them will break way early and some of them last way longer than expected the the type of bolt, the quality of bolt, how it's made, what it's made out of really matters. Mm -hmm. um, but to make a blanket statement as all of them have premature bolt failure with a Grendel AR bolt, that's not true. Not yeah. today. Yeah. The the majority of bolt failures in the Grendel family are hand loaders. And it's it's people that are pushing book data and then going beyond looking yeah. for velocity. Yeah, that bolt is designed to run at 52,000 pounds average pressure. And if you're running it at 58,000 pounds average pressure right. and you, you know, adjustable gas block and you're running a gun and it's screaming bullets and shooting great. Everything's groovy till it's not. Yeah. And that's uh, the AR-15 bolt, regardless of caliber is a fatigue wear item. Yeah. You're, it's going to happen. It has you a shoot fatigue enough life it. and eventually you'll break lugs even in a 5.56. Now you, you cut into that, you decrease the fatigue life by loading it more with the SPC or the, or the Grindel, either or. They both lessen bolt life. Um, but yeah, you should get whatever, eight to 10,000 rounds out of a bolt, out of a Grindel bolt, if you load yeah. it to pressure. Awesome. Which right. is around the barrel life of the, <clears throat> of the Arc or Grendel family of cartridges. Um, and so you replace the barrel because the barrel's burned out. I would suggest you replace the bolt too. Yeah. And, yeah. and even really high quality bolts that we, you guys have talked about, it's not that big of an expense if you're changing barrels out maybe a couple hundred bucks yeah. maximum and you've got a, the highest end bolt that's ever made. Sure. So, all right, guys, here's one for you out of right field. Not sure you're going to know the answer to this one. So I did some, put some stuff on the internet machine in the Googleizer, got the answer. Uh, it's from the 6.5 Creedmoor podcast, episode 83. Where did the name Creedmoor come from specifically? Anybody right. know? It was a combo, combo, C -c -c combo deal with Creedmoor Sports, wasn't it? <clears throat> yeah, before that, though, I believe before, it was oh. the Creedmoor Range in New York, yes. I believe. So the newly formed National Rifle Association purchased 
70 acres of land to establish a long-range shooting range. And they purchased it from Bernardos Hendrickson Creed. And that last name, Creed, uh, was the foundation of what they named the Creedmoor Range. Yeah. And so it's still, yeah, it's still iconic. And it was a, a c- c- combo between Creedmoor Sports. Uh, but Creedmoor Sports, that name comes from the iconic Creedmoor Range where they held thousand yard matches back in the 1870s to 1890s and beyond. So it came from the man who sold the 70 acres to build the range. Pretty neat piece of history that I did not know. All right. In regard to Long Range Made Easy, episode number 102, Brad Off Grid Homestead, he says, ammunition temperature plays a greater role than ambient temperature in regard to Long Range Made Easy. Uh, I think that's, you can't say that as a statement, but it's certainly a nuanced answer because they both have a part. I'd love to hear you guys' opinion on ammunition temperature plays a greater role than ambient temperature. It could, <clears throat> mm-hmm. yeah. If if the if it's really bad, right? yeah. Uh, a lot of your ammunition uh, temperature sensitivity is tied to the propellant and primer, <clears throat> and so if those aspects of the cartridge are on the on the more variable side of of ammunition temperature sensitivity performance, okay, sure. But the point of that podcast was mainly discussing the engagement ranges where most of those little nuances are kind of normalized and mm-hmm. don't really have a large enough effect to cause you to miss necessarily. They're going to contribute to it, right? You're going to have a, a, a stacking biased shift in a direction if all those things line up, but um, no, they both matter. Sure. Yeah. Some can be, one can be more important than the other. It depends on the environment, temperature of the ammo, mm-hmm. the quality of the propellant or the temperature stability of the propellant. And and I, how big of a temperature swing you're shooting in. And and all other things left out, I would argue that temperature is more important than ammunition temperature sensitivity because temperature plays two roles in ballistics. It plays a role in influencing the air density that the projectile is traveling through, and it also influences the Mach number. And the Mach number goes back to all of the aerodynamic moments and coefficients that a, a projectile is going to have changes in Uh, as a function of the Mach number. So everything else can be identical, different temperature, different Mach number, bullets can respond differently. different drag. And that has nothing to do with long range made easy. For for more information on what you just said, you better check out the podcast we've done on external ballistics and some of the advanced external ballistics that we've talked about. Yeah. All right. You got anything on that one? That's pretty much it. They both matter. They both matter. Redefining varmint hunting and target shooting. The Hornady ELD VT. ELD VT bullets feature the heat shield tip, which resists the effects of aerodynamic heating. The lead core has been moved rearward, producing enhanced in-flight stability. Amp bullet jackets are used to ensure every ELD VT bullet performs at its peak potential. The dual-purpose bullet for varmint and target shooting. ELD VT bullets from Hornady. All right, 22 Arc Podcast. Todd Parsons, 2980. He says. What's the optimum barrel length? What's the optimum barrel length on a 22 arc? Besides from the answer of whatever you want, everything, you know, personal preference, what do you guys think optimal barrel length is? You go first. I've never had this question ever about any <laughs> cartridge. Not once. So you go ahead. Uh, I'd probably do an 18 to 20. Yeah. Just, yeah, you get, especially for varmints. Velocity is kind of your friend there. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the time you're in pretty open terrain. So a little bit longer barrel isn't hurting you. Yep. Yeah. I think, go ahead, Jane, sorry. Uh, I get that question all the time on all aspects of ammunition, right? What's the best bullet? What's the best gun for this cartridge? What's the best barrel length for this cartridge? Whatever it may be. And my, my uh, response is always the same. It's what are you going to do with it? That's because it's all, they're all tools, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So give me a little bit more information and I can give you then the, the pros and cons of what this will do in that situation. But yeah, it totally depends on what you want to do with it. I mean, for what it was designed for, I agree with Miles. Yeah. Um, as a as a really good balance point that kind of touches all the bases of what that cartridge is, is capable of, that's a good barrel length. Yeah. I would say exactly what you said, or I'd second that really well, is that you got to determine what you're going to do with it because a 16-inch barrel might be best for you. 
uh, could be a lot of things. In my personal use of the cartridge, if you're building a gas gun, do an 18. If you're building a bolt gun, do a 20, a couple extra inches, maybe 50 foot of extra velocity for free with two inches of barrel. That's going to be really groovy. If you're running this cartridge PRS gas gun division, which Miles is the only one here, pressed him behind the camera that were crazy enough to do it because um, that brings a whole new ball of wax into precision shooting. Um, 24, 26 yeah. wouldn't hurt you. Yeah, 24, 26. Yep. When you get, it gets a little goofy uh, past about 24 with gas system. Like how long should the gas tube be? Yeah. I, I've had that question a couple of times. Like, I don't know. Haven't yeah. done it. Long but, enough. Yeah. Long enough to yeah. work and not so long that it doesn't. Yeah. So. But a 24 inch barrel on a six arc running our say 75 grain ELD match bullet for PRS gas gun division. That thing's going to be doing over 3000 feet per second from a 24 inch barrel. And it's going to be a laser beam yeah. inside of a half a mile. So yeah. Uh, yeah, it depends on what you're doing. So 18 to 20 for the primary use as a varmint, long range varmint cartridge. If you're using it just for long range competition, doesn't hurt to go with the 24. Moving on to another YouTube comment from One Whole Groups, our discussion about dispersion. Uh, this guy's name is just a series of uh, letters, starts with a G. Um, he asks, I'd love to see a Pareto analysis of issues and their effects on dispersion so we can focus on that top 20% without getting bogged down and distracted by more arcane issues that get swamped out in the results of the top 20%. So, uh, in the 80-20 rule, um, what are the 20% of things that do 80% of the work in regard to dispersion? Um, <clears throat> that's a pretty good question and, a, and an interesting way to think about it. Um, so, for those unfamiliar, the the Pareto distribution says that twenty percent of the population causes like eighty percent of the result. So it's like not you know, it, it's skewed, and there's mm -hmm. all kinds of things that that follow it. But could it be used, or is there any aspects of um, precision or <clears throat> dispersion or shooting that would follow it? I would say that the the twenty percent of things that cause the eighty percent of results in dispersion are what we've kind of talked about in those prior episodes. It would be the bullet, the barrel, the powder, and the charge weight. And changing any of those four combinations is going to see like big changes in the performance. Yeah, dramatic. Yeah. Not seeding depth. <clears throat> not. Depends. Yeah. 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 It's all nuanced, but um, I would say bullet, barrel, powder combo will get you the most of regardless it. of charge weight regardless charge weight w charge weight is like a medium tune and then i would say seating depth in most cases with like a match reamer or any of our modern reamer you know six arc 22 arc six five creed creed more, anything the since creed more basically yep the throat geometry in there is very forgiving for seating depth yeah. um this is some of the older legacy stuff if you have a sammy 300 wind mag throat mm -hmm. then maybe seating depth and if you have a super hyper secant ogive that looks like a cone, mm -hmm. maybe seating depth is something to explore there. That could be kind of a more of a make or break at, in that mm -hmm. sort of situation. But for the most part, with these modern match, or if you use a match reamer, if you have a 243 Winchester, you know, match reamer yeah. that has basically right. the same thing that the Creedmoor has, you know, yep. that, that sort of throat setup, then seating depth is a very small player. It's like kind of a small fine tune. Mm -hmm. Um, charge that, weight one step up from that yeah and then, and then the then big three the biggest thing i mean honestly you could skip most low development techniques that are out there and just try 10 shots each of same bullets and different powders or the same powder and different bullets and mm -hmm. yeah yeah when i say charge weight i don't mean like a traditional ladder test or something where you're doing three like tenths of a grain or yeah. tenth grain yeah, you gotta, or whatever like half or one grain movements down in charge weight i mean we've seen that the majority of the time produces better dispersion not every time it's not exclusive but yeah we've seen that okay big so. changes big changes in charge weight not three tenths at a time yeah, yeah. So there you go for uh the Pareto analysis oh i got one more to throw in there yes expectations who am me you can change your expectations <laughs> yeah well and that goes back to your groups are too small yeah uh, which is what he was commenting on which is you got to get past the three and five shot groups yeah. yeah you have to start putting more rounds on paper and again shifting your expectations of what those results are going to be right. 
and yep. what's acceptable. And it's all predicated too on the on the assumption that like your stock is bedded correctly oh, yeah. and not, nothing shifting around there, optics and all that stuff is yeah. quality and held down right. Yeah. yeah. So presuming that everything is assembled correctly and working as it should and you have good shooting mechanics and fundamentals, if you want to make a big change and you know the 20% of things doing the 80% of the work, what bullet you're shooting, your barrel's got an attitude, it gets a say, and then what powder. Right. All right. One down. Now, moving on to this next page here. We have a question coming from Ferguson Land Management Weld, 1039. On our powder podcast, we talk all things propellant. He said, I'd love to hear a podcast on bullet designs and how each one responds to different barrels and powder types and the best seating depths for said designs. Now, uh, it's not necessarily a question. He requested a whole podcast about it, but uh, I do think you guys could dive into the Hornady bullets um, and all of our bullets that I can think of. Certainly anything out of the 2000s and even into the 90s are a secan ogive of some degree, mm-hmm. um, you know, and some more close than others to a tangent like our 180 ELD matches. You know, it's super long and it's got a really close to almost tangent ogive because it's so long. Um, but all of our ogive profiles are very similar and they seem to all shoot well um, from varying seating depths. But I really wanted to focus on his last part of that question is the bullet designs and the best seating depths for said designs. Uh, and then I'd like a part two of that question. I'd like to hear you guys' thoughts on specifically monolithic bullets, but we could also throw in bonded bullets, although we don't do a ton of bonded bullets and how they respond to jumping. Mm. So what do our ogives like for seating depth? Um, and am I close on a, the, what I just said, blanket statement, because there's some new, you know, a tips and yeah, some new ELDs. All, yeah, some of some of the some of the long ogive match bullets are closer to tangent, but they're still secant. Um, yeah, and I think there's a a big misunderstanding, and I had it as well until Miles physically drew a picture for me, so that people have this assumption that tangent ogives are bad and inefficient, and that's only true if you have a limit for head height. But if you could make that bullet infinitely long, you can make a really yeah, low a drag tangent, tangent yeah. ogive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't have a good, concise answer for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Is there anything you've seen trend wise? Maybe not from your mechanical engineering designing bullet side, but just from Miles the shooter. You grab any A tip, any ELD match, any ELDX, any I VT. Jump, I jump them thirty five thousandths, and that's just mostly to stay out of carbon fouling. Like if you get carbon fouling in the throat, and then you're jumping them five or ten thou something tight like that, then you can get. Uh, pressure like velocity pressure velocity spikes Mm -hmm. when you seat then up against the carbon that is formed so So you're a generic 35 off touch blue make it true yeah 35 40 somewhere in there um but i've seen i mean we've done we've done testing on it where we've done 10 thou into the lands back to 120 jump and i'm not convinced that there's a universal right answer Mm. Yeah, I think it depends on <clears throat> that unique set of components, that bullet shape and that lot of bullets, <clears throat> that powder type, and most importantly, that specific barrel. Sure, and the chamber they're in. Yeah, yeah. The The barrel is such a unique part of the combination that I can take, I can take uh, a, a combination of bullet and powder in one barrel that are the best thing I've ever seen and take that same combination and put them out of another barrel and that barrel hates it the components are just as good as they were before they're identical it's the same stuff but this barrel hates it and then i can take something that maybe is a maybe it's a lesser quality component or just totally different components whether it's bullet powder put them in this barrel that didn't like the first thing and it likes it better than the barrel that liked the first thing like the barrel is so unique in the result that that happens that Mm. From a jump standpoint, I don't think there's any rule you can come up with. I would agree with Miles that the general methodology we pick is make it fit the magazine, maybe stay away from the throat a little bit. So if you start to get carbon, you know, build up in the throat, you don't have to deal with any of the repercussions that could come along with that. Um, I think a lot of the concept of, well, what jump is best and how far should I be off the lands and stuff like that is, is based on that small sample size 
nature that we've lived in for you know centuries at this point yeah uh i i think we the the length of time of it of the small sample size existence has like given us this idea that it's valid because it's been around because so it's long been around, it, right. it's valid um but when you when you look at it unbiased and you try to repeat the test to find a repeatable result something you can trust going into the future mm-hmm. it's i haven't seen it right well just anecdotally uh no scientific method here just me shooting you nailed it do they fit in my magazine for my prs rifle for example do they fit in the magazine great are they at least 20 off the lands great i've had things 20 to 30 maybe 20 to 40 and i've had things that fit in the magazine and are jumping almost an eighth of an inch Mm -hmm. uh don't care and it just shoots yeah um yeah one thing i've seen too i I remember this might be useful for some Maybe the the guy that asked the question, but I had a buddy that uh, was was working up a load for a guy that had a custom 300 Win Mag built, and I don't think it was like a match style reamer. I think it was more of a Sammy style reamer where you have quite a bit of clearance um, around the bullet in the in the uh, free bore and uh, into the forcing cone area. And he was shooting one type of bullet that was fairly aerodynamic. It was built for the Win Mag, so it, there's some limitations there, um, but it didn't shoot real well. And he's like, well, what should I do? I've tried these different jump to the rifling. He's tried all this different stuff and it wouldn't, it wouldn't shoot as good as he wanted. And I said, well, you should try this other bullet. And the other bullet I recommended to him was one that had a much longer wheelbase or bore lay length yep. is what we'd call. So just longer bearing surface you could think of it as. Um, and that bullet shot substantially better for him. Now, what part of that made that happen? I have my theories, but I, I don't know for certain, but I would. That relates back to that. 80-20 rule we just talked about. Yeah. You want yeah. to make a big change, change barrel, bullet, powder. 100%. Awesome. All right. Now, a question from uh, Let's Talk Mean Radius, which was a good podcast for us. And the comment comes in from Just Snuggle. And Just Snuggle writes, is there a similar process for finding velocity in regard to finding the mean radius for group size? The average velocity seems to suffer from the same problem as traditional group size. For example, if I shoot a shot string of five shots and they all fall within 25 feet per second, but then I add to it and I have a 100 feet per second high and another that's 100 feet per second low, I don't think those flyers are indicative of the ammo. Do I include those shots in my average velocity or do I just throw them out? Or is there a better answer or a better equation that will give me a more accurate average velocity probability? Yeah, you shoot at least i don't know 15 to 20 rounds and you can get the sd the average the average velocity is going to level out probably within functional use use case like window Mm -hmm. probably in about 15 rounds um 15 to 20 and then the the sd uh in any metric really is pretty worthless below 20 rounds I mean, I say worthless as a predictive tool. Okay. And that's what he's really asking for is right. a better velocity probability output. So he's looking for a predictive tool. Yeah. yeah there's no, I've, I've played around with this a lot here recently. Um, and I haven't found any way to cheat the system to get reliable predictive info out of small sample sets that are less than about 20 rounds. 20, okay. 20 rounds is where... Um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of different metrics all just kind of narrow to a point of being functionally repeatable enough that the error that you're going to get test to test doesn't, doesn't really matter unless you get real, real specific about use case. Okay. Um, yeah. You're saying to get exactly what he's after, just shoot more shots, use all of the velocities that are recorded unless you, if you're using an accurate velocity recording instrument. Right. And there's no reason to question that, um, you know, like if you were having trouble with the magneto speed or having trouble with a shoot through screen or something like that, that's one thing. But if you're using a velocity recording tool that has worked for you and is accurate, include all your velocities and right. just shoot enough to get an adequate yeah. S- yeah. Uh, standard the, deviation. The low probability highs and lows will work themselves out the more rounds that you record. Yeah. Jaden, what would you say? I got... Yeah, two things. One is his comment about like <clears throat> he 
he gets a ES of 25 and then he shoots a couple more shots and he gets a hundred foot fast and a hundred foot slow. Should he trust the ammo? I believe that. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong in what he wrote there, but. He um, says those two flyers aren't indicative of the ammo. Indicative. That's the word. Yeah. I, I would, mean, I would say, are they indicative or not of the ammo? Are they indicative or not of your expectations? Yeah. Because if, that's, if you have a reason to believe that the ammunition was different when those flyers showed up, then it could be indicative of the ammo. Let's say you're a reloader and you're charging some cases and you bumped the reloading tray and it kind of spilled some powder out. You had already seeded five of them, but you had 10 more of them charged and you went ahead and seeded bullets on them anyway. Those other 10 are in question, right? You know, the first five were good and those are the first five you shot. They have an extreme spread of 25 feet per second. And then you decide to shoot a couple more out of those 10 that are kind of in question with spilled powder. Right. Yes. At that point, I would call into question the ammunition. But when you're dealing with small sample sizes at at a sample size of five, I'm going to trust the extreme spread with maybe like, I'm just ballparking numbers here. This isn't like confidence interval in statistics, but a five shot or extreme spread, I'm going to trust like maybe 30%. The standard deviation on a five shot, or I'm going to trust that at like 10%. When you get to 10 shots, I'll trust the extreme spread at like 50 and the standard deviation at like 30 and at 15 extreme spread i'd trust trust at 70 and standard deviation at 60 and then at 20 you know maybe an 85 and a 80 or something right so the the bigger your sample size gets the more trust you can put into the metrics that you're looking at yeah um but yeah i'd I'd agree um the the value he's looking for it. I forget which podcast we talked about it in, but we talked about extreme spread and standard deviation. And in simple terms, extreme spread is a measurement. It's a past tense measurement, meaning it, it, it's based on a recorded result. What did happen? How bad was it? Mm-hmm. And then standard deviation is a predictive tool that can be used in the future if used properly, uh, contingent on the sample size <clears throat> that says, what, what will the future performance be? If I continue to shoot it, um, and to Miles's point, you you have to generate enough of a sample size that you populate a bell curve to then be able to use the bell curve to tell you what's going to happen at a sixty six percent and a ninety five and a ninety nine percent. Excellent, yeah. good answer. So yeah. shoot and, more, and the tool you're looking for is standard deviation, right, Mister Just Snuggle? And yeah. Uh, yeah, as far as expectation, if you expect that every round you ever fire is going to be in a twenty five. Foot per second extreme spread, you might adjust yeah. expectation. I've got yeah. you can do it, but you got to do a lot of work. Everything's got to be right. I've got two points to this. One, I would to just change the question up a little bit that might help put it in in redder reference. He's saying he's got a twenty five foot per second extreme spread, and then he has a hundred foot high and a hundred foot low. I would question your recording tool, your velocity measurement tool, or the ammo because two hundred foot is crazy. Uh, so if that was fifty foot high and fifty foot low for a hundred foot spread. And you shot 30 samples, it's very possible that that's within there. Okay. The other thing I would mention is if you are going to shoot the shots and everything's good, you, you do want to include those numbers. Uh, and a good case in point is you could take, Miles, I know you've done this, 100 shots, and you could have a 90 foot extreme spread, which most people would say is atrocious. 90 foot spread is horrible. You can have a single digit SD. I don't know if you get 90 foot out of a single, you get, you'll get 50 foot though. And a lot of people like that we talk to, you know, you say, oh, I got like a 45, 50 foot extreme spread. And they're like, oh my God, what, you know, yeah. what are you doing? You should be down like in the twenties, maybe 30. Yeah. Anything over 30, I'd, I'd look, you know, go keep looking. And it's like, realistically, if you shoot enough, you're going to get yeah. that, that same thing that we talked about earlier with the pressure peak pressure and the pressure area under the curve changing, you know, whatever, peak pressure changing yeah. a couple thousand PSI, it, it manifests itself as velocity. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you're doing a chemical potential energy transfer into kinetic energy transfer, and there is some variation there. Right. Um, and again, yeah, we're kind of unique in that we have really focused on the large sample stuff, so we got a little bit, you know, 10,000 foot view on it. But uh, yeah, if you, if you shoot small, like five shot, 10 shot strings, 
it's very easy to fall in the trap of saying, oh, well, my stuff shoots 25 foot per second or better all the time. And then when, you know, you shoot a five shot string and it's 25 foot per second for four. And then one of them is like, brings it up to 40 foot per second. You're like, oh, something was wrong with that round. Yeah. Or even 60 or 70 feet per right. second. Right. I've had people record factory ammo strings. Oh, this, something's wrong with the factory ammo. I had a 70 foot stream spread. Yeah. You could easily, you could easily have, shots. yeah, you could have a, maybe a 10 to 15 foot per second SD on that stuff. And for factory ammo, that's. Pretty, yeah. pretty solid. I would contend if you are a hand loader and you have a match rifle and you record velocity on a hundred shots, you'd be surprised how bad your extreme spread is and how good your standard deviation is. Right. If you, yeah. if you recorded a hundred <clears throat> shots. Yeah. And, and yeah, whatever I'll, I'll get into it. But like the zero to 10 range is just complete chaos. As far as I repeat the test, repeat the test, repeat the test, repeat the test. Your SD and ES is going to vary dramatically over uh, 10 shots or less in a group. Mm -hmm. And you repeat that, repeat that, repeat that. You're going to see a ton of variation in that. And then as you get into like that 10 to 15 range, you'll see it narrow down a little bit and it'll be a little bit more controlled. And then by the time you get to like 20 to 30, those, those results end up being very consistent, repeatable yeah. test to test. There's still some variation there. It doesn't really settle out until you start shooting like 50, 100, 200 shot strings. But I mean, like to come back to exactly the same number, but yeah. The, and the variability on extreme spread stays more variable longer as you shoot rounds, more rounds down. Mm -hmm. So the, the mean radius information will converge sooner, but it still takes 20 to 30 rounds to like really converge. Excellent. Hornady Security Mobilis Safes. Discover the ultimate solution for safeguarding your valuable equipment with Hornady Security Mobilis Safes. Offering an innovative modular design, Mobilis Safes can be easily transported and assembled piece by piece in any room. Featuring a full square lock interior organizing system that maximizes storage space with countless storage configurations. Elevate your security with Mobilis Safes from Hornady Security. Moving on to uh, Monster K7603 on the Let's Talk Twist Rate podcast. We got real in-depth on the history of twist rate, why it's necessary, got into um, bullet stability, all these things. Um, that was great. Now, he doesn't have a question. He has a statement, but it's worth reading. And he says, this is great info. It took me three attempts to listen through the entire thing without going deer in the headlights. We've all been there. Jaden is great. He looks like your drunk uncle, but speaks like a college professor. That's awesome. And I tip you hat, my hat to you, Mr. Monster K. That's a nail, just nailed it. Uh, having Was it scary uncle uh, and no. drunk professor? <laughs> <laughs> drunk uncle and college professor and having uh, known Jaden personally now for north of a decade, exactly that. Yeah. You'll find me in the cave. Uh, all right. Uh, moving on now to uh, the warrior's mind. He commented on a, a, not a podcast, but a video where we talked about the 22 arc and we compared it to the 224 Valkyrie. And he says, we really need to compare those cartridges with the same bullet under the same load, the 224 Valkyrie uh, with the 88. For example, Federal loads their 90 grain bullet at 2700, but Hornady only loads their 88 at 2675. That doesn't make sense. My 224 will shoot the same as the 22 arc. Also, I don't like the idea of Hornady being the only manufacturer of the round. So uh, when someone says you can't compare the 22 Arc and the 22, uh, 224 Valkyrie, because with the same bullet, the Valkyrie is going slower. What, what would you say to that? Sorry, Valkyrie. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, that was, that was well, one of the uh, motivating principles behind the 22 Arc taken from concept to a product is that it outperforms the Valkyrie. Yeah. And there's a specific reason that our 88 grain load is not doing 2,700. Yeah. Because we started it there. That's back when you and I were, yeah. were doing stuff together. And the, the dispersion of that thing across multiple systems was atrocious. Yeah. It, it was right horrible. next to worthless. Absolutely. And we, we, yeah. I we was spent for that. Yeah we, we, yeah. we spent three weeks shooting that thing, trying to do, to find a load that would be competitive with the ammo that was already out on the market mainly that federal load uh and it was like well yeah we can achieve that velocity that's no big deal at safe pressure limits easy day we can do that uh, all day long but can we do it with a level of dispersion that we're willing to put out there as yeah. a product with our name on it the answer was no, no it took us three weeks and we finally came up with the trade-off of the level of dispersion of this load 
and a little bit lower velocity is the is the best blend of all things yeah. considered. And that twenty five foot per second reduction in velocity, I, I want to say it it more than cut dispersion in half. I yeah. remember shooting oh, yeah. two and a half and three inch groups at a hundred yards from the accuracy fixture. Yes, uh, at twenty seven hundred feet per second average with the propellants that would do it. We found a propellant. We had to reduce it 25 feet per second, and now we're shooting MOA or better. Yeah. Yeah. If you just want red hot speed, and that's the only thing you care about, and you're just going to, you know, you care what this version looks like, <laughs> we're, we're probably not the ammo supplier for you. I mean, we're, we're trying to, we're trying to blend all the different aspects of performance and make all of them as good as possible. Yep. I agree. And, uh, yeah, we talked earlier about some of the design attributes that, you know, we fought with the Valkyrie, um, and the, the 22 arc, we just feel is a better mousetrap. In regard to your last statement, we're the only manufacturer that makes the round. Uh, that is true uh, as of right now. I'm sure that so will change. It hasn't even gone through Sammy. Yeah, final it's not. Approval yet. Yeah, it gets approved in like three weeks. Uh, so, uh, but just like the seven PRC, you can buy multiple flavors of seven PRC today. Then it's not yeah. just Hornady. Yeah, it'll it'll come with time. Absolutely, yeah. and it is an absolute blast to shoot. It just it doesn't matter what if you're shooting the 62s, you're shooting the 88s, you're shooting the 75s, gas gun, bolt gun, barrel length. Everything performs equally well, and that was one of the beautiful things with the 22 arc. Like you mentioned, the motivating principles that we didn't experience with the uh, 224 Valkyrie, because on top of trying to get the 88 grain load to shoot, we also had to make a 60 grain varmint load that would run the guns and uh, lock back on an empty magazine and still shoot accurately. And that again was a whole nother can of worms. Mm -hmm. All right, so moving on to. Archer Twin 22 on YouTube, he commented on how a commercial cartridge is born. And that happens when the 30 out 6 loves the 270, you end up with the 25 out 6. No, uh, uh, no, he commented on how commercial cartridges are born. What do people mean when they say that a chamber is designed to match the cartridge? Isn't that, isn't the chamber just the negative of the cartridge? Or is there more of an issue when standardizing a wildcat? And I think here, I'd love to get your guys' opinion. I think uh, the dimensions and the tolerances and those tolerances stacking on each other are one of the key takeaways here. So what does it mean when someone says the chamber is designed to match the cartridge? So you got uh, the minimum chamber and the maximum cartridge on the tolerance spectrum. Yep. Uh cannot like interfere. interfere. Yeah. That's that's the main thing. And then the bulk of the rest of everything that you see is well, you'll see anywhere from 2 to maybe 5 4 5 thousandths over on body diameter up through the body, through the shoulder, and mm -hmm. then the neck, you maybe see a little bit more variation there. And then yeah, where it really matters for as far as we're concerned for accuracy and fitting, you know, to a cartridge at a specific length is, is that throat geometry and how much clearance there is between the bullet and the, the free bore. And then how much in front of the case mouth that you have cylindrical section, that's, you know, just a little bit over bullet diameter before you start the forcing cone. Uh, that's, those are, I think the yeah. main, the main points where you run into contention with wildcatters where, in my experience, the, the biggest thing is the f the length of that free bore, that just over bullet diameter portion in front of the case yeah, mouth. That's generally cylindrical. Yeah. Yeah, th yeah not always. Um, 6.5 Grindel. But uh, the length of that on a lot of wildcatters, they will set a particular bullet to a particular magazine length and then see how much they need to jump that bullet whatever 10 mm -hmm. 15 thousandths 20 thousandths whatever the number is and then they set the free bore on the reamer that they order to that number well then that may be shorter or longer than what eventually comes out as a sammy standardized cartridge and you can run into interference issues there right, right. yeah it's generally shorter <clears throat> yeah most guys that'll wildcat the issues you run into with a, a cartridge that becomes standardized and then tries to fit in that chamber is a lot of those wildcat guys let's say they're going to run a a long range style bullet. So it has a really long cylindrical ogive to it that allows you to bring the, <clears throat> the, the forcing cone part or the shorten up the free bore so that it's shorter and it works just fine with that bullet at that length. But then you try to take, let's say a spire point, a traditional hunting bullet that has a much more plump and shorter ogive to it. 
and you try to seat it to a length that'll work and now you're contacting the rifling there mm -hmm. so when they're when they're designed concurrently you can avoid all those issues because we're putting in the the forethought of all not designing it with a current limitation meaning it will work with all the bullets you know that we want it to now but also future limitation you know leaving leaving some room for future potential on on new designs and capabilities mm -hmm. awesome yes so yes the chamber is just the negative of the cartridge but it's the tolerances associated with that uh specifically with our cartridges since the 30 tc and forward um that we purposefully lay out that basically the neck diameter and then everything forward of that those tolerances and dimensions uh really lend themselves to accuracy and that's the difference between earlier we talked about the 300 wind mag which is a notoriously loose standard chamber mm -hmm. dimensions in those critical areas that really have a you know a big say in accuracy um, we control those to a little bit tighter dimensions uh, and again like you mentioned we design them concurrently so that the ammo today the bullets today the bullets tomorrow everything works and jives and that's where you can run into issues just like you mentioned with wildcat so hopefully that answers his question all right greg remmer 9069 he commented on how cartridges are born as well nothing to do with cartridges he wants to hear more about Jaden's elk hunt oh uh, so let's let's divulge for a couple minutes there we are colorado mm -hmm. you're equipped with nothing but a seven prc mm -hmm. how do you come out alive? and a loincloth and a loincloth yeah <laughs> uh, very caveman style uh okay i'll try to make it brief um did you fashion sandals no unnecessary no. the I ground have, was frozen. i had boots on but it was the wrong boots which i'll get to here in a minute um <laughs> wrong feet no feet were right boots <laughs> oh, okay. were wrong <laughs> he labeled them feet. he's got uh, tape in there <laughs> right and left uh <laughs> yeah so we put in quite a few miles um didn't really see a ton of sign uh in the area we traditionally hunt so i'm hunting with uh with mark if he hears this um he's kind of my mentor growing up taught me how to hunt took me under his wing um and we've we've continued a strong relationship to this day so uh hunted all over <clears throat> couldn't couldn't find a whole lot there was this giant herd of elk that was holed up on private ground just you know what else some of their nose at us yep um and uh caught them caught them moving they were up and running one morning and um they were heading towards an area that that we could get to and so started heading that way just to try to you know see if maybe we could time it right or not um on the way passed up 10 bulls so mark started calling me Jaden 10 bulls because uh -huh. i was like no let's leave those bulls so they were in like this this grassy plain that would have been really difficult to get a stock um on them so but they were bedding down so i didn't think they were going anywhere so we'll pass okay. those up <clears throat> we sound go. decision yeah so we we go and and we're pretty sure timing wise we can get to a spot where we can get a shot before they pass us right and, and we miss the opportunity so um get all the gear start running through this this little field that was uh it was an irrigated field with with cattle bulls in it and they were i grew up around cattle and you, know, you never know with a bull you, you know? never you don't know. know what his they, temperament they're is. feeling squirrely they will get squirrely and so i did have the thought that like oh this will be great like if i get stomped by a bull while trying to go get a different species of bull uh but anyway, run through this field. Uh, the wrong boot portion is I didn't have my waterproof boots because it was going to be like forty-five or fifty degrees. Amateur hour. Do my feet? I have to. My feet are messed up from yeah. a long time ago, and so I have to. I have to care for my feet a little bit more. So I, anyway, I want them. To I'm breathe, right there with you, you. know. And uh, so I'm so I'm running through this this field, and it, oh, my feet get wet. So I'm like, oh, cool. I hope this doesn't go late into the night because this is going to suck. Yeah. Not only um, am I going to get stomped by a bull, I'm going to have wet feet. Yeah. And up in front of us is kind of this plateau, and that's where the elk were. It was up on this plateau, um, heading kind of in our direction. So we're heading south. The elk are heading north. We're and offset. By sorry. It. What day of the hunt? How many days have you put in to get to this point? I think this was Wednesday and started hunting Saturday. Okay. So you've been in it. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, at this point in the hunt, because I, uh, I hunt for meat first. Um, if I can get a cool set of antlers, that's just a bonus, you know? Yeah. Um, but I'm there for me, me and my family eat the whole thing. So, um, at this point in the hunt, I'm like, I'm going to shoot the first legal bull that gives me the opportunity because it's elk hunting. And that's kind of my general default anyway, because I've struck out before and tag soup tastes horrible at a thousand dollars a pop, even with hot sauce. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so we're, we're heading, we're heading towards where we think we can cross or get a shot or at least see them. And there's this, this plateau in front of us and kind of like a sloping hill. <clears throat> maybe 
couple hundred feet high that we have to be able to climb up to then see up on that plateau where they were. And halfway up, halfway up that hill is a stream bank that or a stream that cuts the, kind of the 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 bank of the hill, and uh, it's like four foot down. Um, and there's no way I can jump it. And Mark's shorter than I am, mm-hmm. and uh, so there's no way Mark can jump it. And so we run up one side looking for a place to cross, nothing. So we run up the other side, and I stumble across this rickety tree that's fallen across this creek. I'm like, well, I looked down, and it was, you know, like I said, probably about four feet down into the water. And I figured if it broke and I fell down in there, I'd be able to, I could crawl back out of there if I had to. Yeah, better um, than getting stomped by mm, a bull. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. So I went for it. Uh, the tree was cracking, but I made it across. And then Mark, uh, I guess in a in an indirect way of calling me fatter than him, said, uh, well, I saw you get across it. And I figured with your rifle and gear, if you made it, I could. So then Mark comes cam- scampering across. We go running up this hill. And uh, at the top of the hill was a kind of a row of cottonwood trees. Um, and this is kind of sagebrushy ground. So there's not much cover. Um, I start to crest up by the cottonwoods and kind of peek up over the, the silhouette of the hill. And there's like, th- I can see three sets of antlers, pretty small, small bulls. Um, some spikes, but I immediately was like, oh crap, like they're on us. Right? Game time. So our timing is like meeting. Um, yeah. I, I, I was assuming in my mind that we would crest that hill, see the elk a couple hundred, you know, you play this like romantic oh, yeah. story in your mind. Yeah. It never works that way. Dust the spr- site post Exactly. Off and, yeah. 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 Take a look at the cartridge real good before you chamber it. Yeah. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so I immediately like duck down to get below line of sight. Uh, and I had my tripod with me and I immediately started getting the tripod legs extended and Mark kind of catches up to me and I tell him they're right there. So he kind of works around my side and up the hill a little bit cause he's shorter than me. So he needs a step stool to see what I can see, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, so he's looking and he's kind of giving me, uh, an idea of what's going on while I'm setting up the tripod. He's like, there's, there's a couple pretty decent bulls there. Well, they would have need needed to walk, um, walk another 30 or 40 yards before I would have had a line of sight shot because all I could see was antlers. I couldn't see the bodies. And so I set the tripod up and got the gun mounted to it and oriented it in that direction as though like a kind of little ambush spot. Yep. And um, and Mark's just still kind of looking or whatever. And then he he uh, he like starts hitting me and he says, don't shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot. I'm like, I'm going to shoot anything. Yeah. I got no <laughs> shot, you know. And he's like, there's a monster coming. And I said, okay, well, I can't see anything. Can I get to where you are so I can see him? goes yeah so he takes a couple steps back i you know the guns arced into the tripod so i just pick the gun up tripod comes with it i take a couple steps up set the tripod down and as mark takes one more step back i see the i see a bull that's a monster i don't know if that's the one that he's talking about turned out it was he was the only one in the herd um but i was like that's yep that that, bull's gonna get a bullet he's got my eye yeah um but all again all i can see is antlers i have no shot on the body mark takes one more step back and breaks this this stick or now that is or something that's you could have called that a hun- everybody listening knew somebody's going to step on a twig and it's going to go yeah big big loud snap right yep. the la- the, you probably heard it from nebraska it was probably so loud. yeah um and that big bull he was kind of like quartered away and that snap happened and he snaps around and locks on me and so i froze and uh waited and it felt like forever i think it was probably only maybe five to 15 seconds he wasn't spooked he was just looking at where that sound came from and in hindsight, if this wouldn't have happened, none of this would have, would have ended up ha- happening. So it was good that Mark stepped on that stick, but <clears throat> the, the bull, uh, stares for, like I said, five to 15 seconds, and then is uneasy enough that he kind of turns and starts to run away from us and takes that, those, uh, other bulls, yeah. those spikes with him. Well, as soon as they do that, I move farther up the hill so I can get line of sight onto their body. And, uh, did that and they go out maybe 150 ish yards. I think it was. And they turn broadside and, uh, they're all mingled in there. And I have, I had a shot on the bull, but there was a bull behind him. And I yeah, definitely not going to do that. I didn't want to take that chance. I was hunting with seven PRC, 175 ELDX at a range of 150 yards. I was very, very confident that that bullet would be recovered on the offside hide, but I'm, I don't want to take that chance. I owe it to the animal to do it right. Right. Um, so <clears throat> In my scope, I start to pan to the right because they're, they're kind of me- milling to the right. So I pan to the right ahead of the bull to see, is there going to be any windows he's going to walk through that I can get him? Well, I see like a two foot wide window between the brisket of a bull on the left of my field of view and the butt of a bull on the right of my full field of view. <clears throat> and as I looked at that, that gap, <laughs> the bull starts to come into my line of sight. And so the timing was like, you, you either shoot him in that two foot gap or 
you don't, don't shoot him. You yeah. either do or you don't, you know? And I did. And I smacked him, um, made a good shot. I, I didn't see the impact, right? 150 yards off a tripod recoil with a 10 pound, seven PRC was enough. I couldn't watch yeah. the impact. Suppressed, of course. Suppressed, but the the wallop was, yeah. was confidence building. You know, I knew I hit him pretty good. That herd runs off. Um, they're, they're running away. And he didn't seem like he was hurting too bad. He was a monster. Um, I hit him good. I got both lungs on that shot after we after we got him down. Um, but he, you wouldn't have known Typical it. Typical bull elk. Yeah, yeah, just tough as nails. Um, so they're kind of trotting away. And the bull, the bull is uh, away from the rest of that herd enough that I had a clear shot on him. Um, but he's running straight away from me. I didn't want to uh, damage any meat on the hind quarters. Um, so as soon as he started to turn enough that I could see the back seam of his rib cage, I hit him again there, boom, he went down and Mark completely lost it. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't remember how old Mark is. He's probably early sixties and was acting like a three-year-old. I mean, I've been there <laughs> just incoherently jumping around screaming, yep. hitting me. So I'm working, right? I'm hunting. I got a job and that job's not done until I know the animal's down. So when I fire that second shot. I bolt another one in, I get back on the gun and I'm focused and watching him. Meanwhile, Mark is Mark, losing Mark his watched mind. the whole thing happen. So he knows that that bull's down for the count. I don't know that because I was recovering from recoil and he's like hitting me and jumping around and I'm like, Mark, stop. Like you're shaking me. And he's just going crazy. And I finally, I reach over and I whack him on the leg and I'm like, knock it off. Like you're, <laughs> you're shaking me all over. And, uh, that's when he was like, no, he's down, he's down. And, uh. That's pretty cool. Mark's always told me that he wanted to be with me when I saw a bull that made me weak in the knees. Yep. And uh, after I kind of snapped out of the, the work bubble, um, I looked up through the scope and <clears throat> you could see his, his, his third antlers. just just monster. Yep. And uh, Maybe we should drop a photo in. Yeah, I do that. And uh, I went weak in the knees a little bit. I started I started shaking and I told Mark, I was like, well, you, you got your wish. I, yeah. you know, my knees are shaky. So incredible hunt. Um, couldn't have shared it with a with a better person and uh very very fortunate yeah you're eating him as we speak family's yeah. wolfing down on the elk and you've got a true giant to hang on the wall one day yeah that was probably longer than it needed to be but no, it's kind of a cool story it's exactly what it needed to be well cool. thanks for sharing that yeah find the latest shirts hats hoodies and accessories that you see here on the podcast and much more at hornadygear.com Getting back into the technical stuff, uh, we did a podcast about our Bore Driver ELDX bullet, which was a 2023 product. Outstanding bullet for uh, taking your inline muzzle loader and adding 100, 200 yards extra onto your performance window just by opting for a really efficient bullet. And he wants to know what's the minimum velocity for expansion. So uh, I called one Ryan Damon, who designed this bullet, did all the testing on this bullet. And what he recommended was. A little bit of nuance here that this bullet needs to be spun up properly to get stability. And to do that, you don't want to do it with a two pellet load at 1500 feet per second. You want to put an honest, you know, we measure by weight. So 70 to 80 grains of weight, roughly 100, 120 grains of volume of propellant to get that bullet doing about 1800 feet per second. That's going to build up the pressure to get it spun up, provided it's properly spun up that thing will expand down to about 1,200 feet per second. That's a lot of lead behind that bullet tip. Yep, that's, that's a lot of capability with a muzzleloader. It really is. All right, moving on to a question coming in from Scott Bailey, 8158. Uh, on the episode 89, where we talked suppressors, he says, I have a question for anyone. Okay, I jump through the hoops. I cough up 200 bucks for a taps, tax stamp, and I get approved. For additional suppressors, what's the process? Re repeat. Same thing. Yep. Which yeah. is, oh my gosh, that's one of the more frustrating things in my opinion. You know, I'm, I would go so far as to be really middle of the aisle on this one. I'll meet you halfway. I'll pay your 200 bucks. I'll wait your, however long it takes to get my first suppressor for every subsequent suppressor. I'll still pay your $200 tax stamp, but why can't I take the darn thing home with me when I buy it? Yeah. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter how many suppressors you buy. It's the same process. And the same ridiculous wait period for all of them. Yep. All right. all right. Next question coming from the parking lot garage. He says, I love all these podcasts in regard to uh, doing load development. I'm going to paraphrase some of this because it's a big, uh, big text block here. He says, I want to play devil's advocate here. 
you've shown that traditional reloading methods and theories don't really matter, or at least as much as we traditionally expected. But I wonder how much of that is due to the truck axle barrels that you guys are using. Since most of us are using thinner profile barrels, uh, maybe less quality, but certainly smaller in diameter than no contour barrels, do you think some of those uh, loading methods have more efficacy for traditional sporter barrels or the heavy sporter barrels or the varmint barrels versus the truck axle barrels? Thoughts? No. No, and we've tested, I mean, yes, our standardized test instrumentation uses inch 250 straight profile barrels for like the accuracy fixture and stuff, mm -hmm. but we've got a vault full of rifles. <clears throat> we've got a ton of uh, rifles where we can change the barrels on them, um, and we shoot all kinds of different profiles of barrel manufacturers of barrel uh, and yeah the the trends that we've observed in like the lab testing are are supported by any gun we've tested from in my opinion yeah awesome yeah. and we, like i said i've got thin profile barrels that i've played around with the same theories like low development testing with my personal guns as well that have thinner profile or carbon wrap barrels that are you know thinner profile steel under all that carbon and uh it's the same you see, you see the same similar very similar behavior it's right just on. uh yeah generally takes longer to do because you're heating the barrel up so right, you gotta shoot smaller right. strings and and uh lighter weight rifles you have to be a better practicer of the fundamentals yeah. the to, nut behind the bolt got to be tight yeah to get the to ring the accuracy out of them but all right Moving on to, it uh, looks like this was an email coming in from Clayton. Uh, Clayton, I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase some of this, uh, and I'll preface the question by saying, we've talked about in several podcasts how traditional means of air quote measuring pressure, i.e. bolt lift, flatten primer, the cratering in the primer, the ejector stamp, that kind of stuff, that those may or may not be present with the presence of pressure north of 65,000 pounds, which is generally accepted as you, you don't see any SAMI approved cartridges north of 65,000 pounds. So his question is, he's got a 223 Remington where he's got a custom reamer, long throat reamer. He seats his bullets out to 2.5 inches, which is, you know, a quarter of an inch longer than the SAMI spec for 223. And he's shooting it in a 30 inch long barrel. His question is, you guys recommend using velocity as your pressure reading tool primarily if you have nothing else because you don't get velocity without pressure but how he's got two control or excuse me two variables that aren't within that sammy window how would you recommend people in that environment gauge where they're at from a pressure and safety standpoint well i'm guessing he's running <clears throat> heavy for caliber 22 cal bullets if he's seating them out that long mm -hmm. um, and especially out of a 30 inch barrel so he's probably doing some sort of long distance shooting um, step one I would look to would be find published load data from a reputable source that has the cartridge and the bullets you're shooting. So the two, two, three and those bullets. So our reloading manual, <clears throat> Hodgdon, yeah, propellant manufacturer websites, whatever it is, that gives you an idea of what the, the max charge produces velocity wise out of a specific barrel length that should be listed from the source. So like in our reloading book, we list that at the, the cartridge page, mm -hmm. uh, how long the barrel was that's associated for those velocities. And then in general, like this is not the absolute rule, but in general, you're going to gain or lose about 25 foot per second per inch across most rifle cartridges. Now, 30 inches for a 223 is pretty long, um, mm -hmm. so that might start to tweak it a little bit, but I would I would take that rule and apply it. So say it's 24-inch barrel velocities, and it's 2,600 feet per second, and your barrel is six inches longer, so you should be... 2,700, 2,750? Yeah, yeah 150, 150 foot, foot faster. faster. So yep. if your load is producing 2,980... When when we just did that correction off of 2600 to get to 2750 and you're getting 2980, I would expect you probably have pressure. Yeah. And I would also contend some of those traditional air quote pressure heating methods may be present. You might. Be, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You open up a bolt that's stiff. Yeah. You, you had to have some pressure to do that. You leak a primer, blow a primer, ejector stamps, all of those things. Again, they may or may not be present, but you're running... In that example, that fast, you're probably going to experience some of those for sure. Yeah. yeah. I think I've said it before on the podcast, but if you experience like ejector swipes, extremely flat primers, primer cratering, 
<clears throat> you, primer cratering is one that depends on the fit between the firing pin and, and the, the hole in the mm -hmm. face of the bolt. So that one, sometimes you can get cratering at normal pressure yeah. or low, low pressure even. But if you get some of those more serious ones, especially ejector swipes, you, you can pretty much bank that you're north of 70,000. Yeah. PSI. You lose a primer, you're north of 70,000. By yeah. a, a bit. And some of that nuance is, you know, actions that have a mechanical ejector, but you don't get the ejector stamp. There's no ejector there. You can still get it. Can you? If you try hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> wow. There's a slot, yeah. right? You can yeah. flow material into that slot. Well, then you're, yeah, you're real, real high. Yeah. So again, I would try to, like Jade said, use that velocity and just trend it with that 25 feet per second per inch. And then it, you're That's, in, you're in the world of wildcatting, even if it's a standardized cartridge, if you're using chamber dimensions that are not standard. And that's what wildcatters do. And you have to accept some of the implications of living in that space. Mm -hmm. And I think a good rule of thumb is be modest. Um, you know, you got that long barrel, you're getting free velocity there. Um, let the, let the velocity or let the barrel do the work for your velocity. Don't stand on it. And just yeah. again, be modest. And when you go modifying throat geometry, that messes with pressure mm -hmm. and it's, uh, I can't give you. I yeah, can't give you any, yeah, yeah. You, you've changed it. I don't know what the impact, you know, the severity of that impact is going to be. Yep. All right. Moving on now to another email in from uh, Brad Hayes. Brad says he's loved the podcast. He just finished up episodes 50, 52, and 57. And he has a question on, is there a device or an application that simplifies or expedites the determination of the XY coordinates of the individual bullet holes when compiling a composite sample? from several three-shot groups, or do you have to simply use caliper? So if you've got several three-shot groups, is there a system that you've used that can compile those so that you can have one group, say, in an app on your phone versus having to do them manually? Mm, <clears throat> nothing that's commercially available that I'm aware of. Maybe on target software, but I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but I will say that's something that we would like to do in the future with the group analysis feature in Ford Office. Yeah, so the group analysis feature will give you it'll give you X Ys. But what well, he's trying to compile groups, and yeah. I will say we've gotten a ton of emails, podcast at Hornady dot com, ton of comments. People want to be able to combine multiple targets into one group analysis. So let that be known that you guys are already aware of that, and it's something we definitely want to implement. Yeah, it's yeah. it's on the list. Um, just when when that one comes up next yep. we're, we're about to finish up a uh a, another another new feature that's going to get pushed out here pretty soon so one once, once that one's done. gone and finalized then we can look at the next thing. Right. this one should be a pretty quick and easy answer uh this email comes in from john uh loves the podcast and all the marketing tools he says you guys keep pushing ford off but none of the bullets that i use are in the ford off library and that kind of makes it irrelevant to me uh, one i would say we have a bc side so if the bullets you want aren't in actual ford off Check the BC side. Um, more importantly, though, I want to get your official answer, though, because he's using 35 cal, 44 cal, and 45 cal bullets, the Hornady FTX, Sub X, those style of bullets. Yeah, so, those, are, those are all going to be in the BC library. Yep. Um, if there's bullets that, that are not in the Fort Off library but are applicable for it, so long range style bullets, um, but let's say bullets designed to shoot beyond 400 yards. Um, if you want to send any of those in, we'll happily add them. We've had a ton of people do that um, yep. over the last year, and uh, we do appreciate them. Th those folks that have sent them in being patient with us. Um, you know, like you've mentioned, we all have a lot of stuff going on. So I think Jacob's adding in fifteen or seventeen more today or tomorrow. Wow! And then we're going to go back out again on Friday. Um, so those bullets are going in, but <clears throat> we kind of had a slowdown period through um fall and and now we're in january of 24 yep. um during fall a lot of guys are out for hunts and stuff yep. like that that kind of interrupts some New of that and then as well. you run into the holiday season so for those that have sent in bullets we certainly appreciate that and um, those files will be coming out soon excellent if you're going to do that please send us like at least 20 or 30 bullets yeah yeah 50 preferably yeah yeah and yeah i don't think people quite understand we have friends all over in the industries you know and at other bullet companies but most of the bullets you see in Ford off that aren't Hornady's, it's because we went to a store or Midway USA or Powder Valley and we paid to buy the bullets to put in the Ford off. Yeah. Uh, so we're getting it done as quick as we can. Uh, and then also some people get confused by this. I think the app updates get the, like they get the new files and then there's a lag time for when the website 
gets them usually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you don't see it on the website and it's you want to, yeah, try the app. in the app. Yep. All right. Moving on to KTM Karate Chips on the Let's Talk Mean Radius podcast. This is a good question here. Um, he said, all right, I did a 15-round a group, and then I figured out my zero angle once, and it worked like a charm, as it should. I had to take the barreled action out of my stock and clean it because I went on a really wet hunt. Good on you. I put it back together, and my impacts are now 0.4 mils low. I thought as long as the scope and the barreled action stayed together, that the zero angle would stay the same. Do I have to redo this process now that I reset the barreled action back into the stock and my zero is now four tenths of a mil low? That to me is more indicative of a betting issue. Um, Not knowing the specifics of what he's got. Yeah, uh, Yeah, it seems like something is is torquing the receiver, like physically bending the the receiver, maybe just a tiny amount, but action screw. In a situation like that, you might get a torque wrench for your action screws and yeah. try to be as consistent yeah. as you can with that. Or Bed the action, look, bed the lug. Yeah, look into like pillar bedding or if it's a mini chassis, even if you put a little bead of bedding compound or like in a circle around the action screw holes, mm. uh, you can isolate the forces basically between the the clamping of the screw pulling the action into the receiver or into the, into the mini chassis or the chassis and just isolate it around the action screw holes. Um, that way it doesn't have a global effect of like pulling the tang down or yeah. sque- you know, splaying the V block out and yeah. squishing. I would say I would go ahead and redo it personally. I've done that personally. Uh, yeah. Just, in this case, redo definitely it. redo it. Yeah. Uh, and definitely verify each time you take it in and out. But I would say in a ideal stock fit situation that shouldn't happen right yeah and we've seen it not happen many many times yeah. i've <clears throat> just experienced it. i literally took a gun apart i took the barrel off of the action and the scope base off the action and cleaned everything down to the smallest screw and put it back together and i was blown away when i went to re-zero it i was going to do that i was going to shoot a 20 shot group and do a zero angle that it was the return to zero was amazing however uh yeah, don't. I've, I don't, I'm not counting on that. I would assume <laughs> anytime I take a barreled action out of the stock, I'm going to have to re-zero it simply because you're relying on other things. You're relying on duplicating the exact fit that you had when you established your zero angle again. And like you said, are you, are you squeezing out yeah. the, the V block uh, of your bed, of your aluminum channel, it's, uh, yeah. bedding the same? Did you torque your screws in the same one, same torque setting, two in the same which action screw did you torque first? There's, I mean, so many other variables. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, but I would say generally, like, I don't experience that with any mm-hmm. of my rifles. Yeah. If, if, if I experience that, I would correct that with the stock okay. personally. That's, a, that's up for the end user to decide. But, uh, y- yeah, you shouldn't see that. That sounds like a betting issue to me. Excellent. Well, moving on here to eric feathered 7226 on the let's talk low data podcast should be a simple quick question great episode uh quick question though uh on different max charges with the same stuff for example the hornady ninth edition says a 65 creedmoor with a 140 loaded with hybrid 100 v has a max charge 42.8 but in the 11th edition that charge is down to 41.3 why the difference between those two manuals with the same set of components Lot to lot variation on powder. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes chamber. we'll sometimes we'll reshoot old data and yeah, it's you know, things get updated over time. <clears throat> it's it's with these current components. That's that's what we yeah. saw. I mean th- there was nothing wrong with the original data. That was true of the time of yep. the powder lots and the barrels and stuff that we had yeah. at the time. And, yeah. and I, I guess that highlights the fact that although we ach- that was max load for what we achieved with our barrel, our chamber, our throat, that brass, that bullet lot number, and that lot number of propellant, all, every one of those has an opinion on what that max load is going to be. Mm-hmm. And that's what we establish. And what we document as maximum in our set of components is likely not maximum in yours. Yours could be lower than that. Or it could be higher than that. Mm-hmm. And there's no way for you to know exactly what the maximum is. And again, that's just highlighting the fact that the little things change in throat geometry, uh, powder variation from lot to lot. Um, everything has an opinion, and that, like I said, exemplifies that. Yeah. yeah, and that I don't know. It goes back to I think we had a podcast, you know, about about this subject. But like 
people get on us for, you know, or, uh, people get a, the industry wide, not just Hornady specifically, but, you know, like lawyer loads mm-hmm. in book data. And it's not the case. You can see variation lot to lot in bullets, lot to lot in powder, especially uh, different case manufacturers change yeah. the internal volume. Chamber to chamber. Chamber to chamber, bore to bore. There are a lot of different influencing factors that can make one barrel pressure limit at you know, a certain charge weight and then another barrel pressure limit at something, a grain or two different. Exactly. Yep. It's just a reference book. It's yep. what happened when we did it. Yep. Right on. All right. This is the last question and a question for me, actually. Uh, another great episode in regard to Let's Talk Load Data. He says, I wonder if the Hornady Reloading app gets updated as you publish new data or if it only gets updated when you publish a new edition. And to answer that, um, yes, when we develop new data, It will be published in the Reloading app if you are a subscriber. Uh, So you can make a one-time purchase uh, for the Reloading. You can do just a chapter if you just want a certain cartridge or two. Or you can purchase the current manual. Or you can get a subscription, which gets you the most up-to-date data. So as the data gets shot and developed, say for new cartridges, that will get updated into the uh, Reloading app for the subscribers. So you do get access to that. That's one of the benefits of subscribing on the Reloading app. And then, of course, when we come out with that next edition, uh, it'll all be in there. Well, so with that, I flip my last page. I have no further questions for you, although there are, you know, many, many pages of questions that we didn't get to. I didn't even answer all of these ones um, before making this thing too long. So, one, I know you guys are swamped this time of year. Uh, I know there's some big projects that you specifically are working on that I'm waiting on. Yeah, I'm Uh, sorry. No, (laughs) you don't have to be sorry. Uh, so I just want to thank you guys for carving out an hour and a half to address some of these questions and interact with our consumer. Because again, like I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, well over a hundred episodes in, and we've got individual episodes that'll have a quarter of a million views on YouTube, uh, you know, tens of thousands of downloads per episode. Uh, and in some instances, hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube per, on individual episodes. It's just great to see our consumers, one, getting information that they deem is valuable to them, and two, uh, gives them a chance to interact with us by sending in these questions. So uh, anything you want to leave our, our listeners with? Hey, it's, uh, hopefully it's educational and, and helpful for people. And entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. If and I'm the, what was I, the scary drunk no, uncle professor? No, you were the drunk yeah. uncle, but the smart professor. Oh, okay. Uh yeah, no, it's great. I uh, appreciate the interaction. Those are all good questions. It's uh, it's cool to see the the level of questions that people have after we do like a subject, you know, because it kind of lets you, it's like a check on how well you're putting out information or not. So yeah. pretty cool. Awesome, guys. Well, thanks again. Yeah. yeah. I especially like all the comments about all the Hornady people being bald. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to address that? <laughs> how do I address it? Well, there's all these people commenting that it's time for me to shave my head. Do it. Well. <laughs> it's a it's a problem because so I watch YouTube videos once in a while and all these YouTube people get on there and they say you know like subscribe and comment right that like helps yep. the the robot that shows your videos or not mm-hmm. well you guys are causing your own problems because every time you comment that I need to shave my head that gets us more attention so if I don't shave my head and you continue to comment about me not shaving my head it's gonna extend Accelerate. the time until yeah. I eventually shave my head. So the only way to get me to shave my head is to stop saying that I need to shave my head. I know it's counterintuitive and I didn't make these rules. Okay. This no, is, this is just an the, algorithm. The YouTube people say. Yep. That, I, you, that's, uh, that's the conundrum I find myself in. I'm not a scientist, but the math checks out. It so, does. Yeah. Uh, you heard it here first. If you want Jaden to shave his head, stop commenting on him about it. But, <laughs> but then how am you. I going to know if they want it? See, I don't know how we hash. I don't know how this solves. Yeah, itself. I don't know. I think nothing to it but to do it, man. It's 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 a great ride. Just send it. I'll do it. I'll 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 surprise the audience one of these days. Oh my goodness! Who knows when? Stay tuned, Miles. You gonna do it? Shave no, my head. Gotta, yeah. If I had a head of hair like his, I'd punch you for saying that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I do need a haircut. <laughs> All right. Before this devolves, uh, thanks again, guys. <laughs> Everybody, hopefully you enjoyed this Q&A episode with Jaden and Miles. Uh, it's something that we enjoy getting to interact with you, the listener. Now, it is January. That means it's trade show season. We've got the Dallas Safari Club coming up. We've got SHOT Show. We've got Safari Club International. And we've got the NRA Show here in a couple months. So if you're at any of those shows, please swing by the booth. 
We'd love to hear from you. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We'll catch you on the next one.